Thanks, Tim, for being with us today. I really appreciate your taking time for our Speaking Truth to Youth project. I have a couple of questions I want to ask. The first one is, what events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? When I was growing up, I spent uh, a lot of time in the wilderness with my family. That was both recreational, backpacking and whitewater canoeing and, and all of that kind of stuff, but also doing a lot of stuff with the, the local chapter of the Sierra Club in West Virginia, which was a chapter that my mom started and was very active in. So we would go out on a lot of um, trail building projects and lots of group gatherings and that sort of thing. These were also the folks that were fighting mountaintop removal in West Virginia in the, in the early days of it back in the 80s. Those experiences were really integrated, falling in love with the natural world, but doing it in a way that one was connected with other people who were, who were also having that experience. And also was, had sort of a sense of agency and engagement. I wasn't just there sort of like just appreciating the pure wilderness, that we, we had an active responsibility to help take care of that space as well. With the threats to that, to that natural world, we certainly had agency in doing something about it and protecting those places as well. A really clear memory of mine when I was a kid, was on a backpacking trip in, in West Virginia, I believe in the Monongahela National Forest somewhere, just walking through and all of a sudden coming out of really healthy woods and stumbling right into a clear cut. I can really clearly remember the feeling that I had and the just the energy that I was sensing from my family and my parents of realizing like this is this is something really painful. This is a deep wound that that we're all feeling right now. And also something outrageous, something anger-inducing. It was a very fresh, poorly done clear cut, you know, sloppy kind of disrespectful to the land kind of clear cut. Those threats were really clear to me, you know, seeing what the fossil fuel industry was doing to those wild spaces and really having that clear example from my elders that we're going to, we're going to love these places. We're going to appreciate them. We're going to feel the suffering and the grief when we see these places being harmed and we're going to fight back. Like we're going to organize together, we're going to support each other, and we're going to fight back even against these incredibly powerful industries. That I think has served as a lot of the foundation for a lot of my work ever since. I'm curious about a couple of things. Conversations that you probably had with your family about you know, how to respond to this, because it sounds like they were obviously environmental activists. And, and then also in school, did you ever have anything in school that kind of addressed those issues? Definitely not in school. You know, when I was a kid in West Virginia, we were sort of subtly taught that most of us were going to go work for the coal industry. And if you were smart and you worked hard, then you could go work for the natural gas industry. Our school supplies either had the coal industry logo on them or the natural gas company logo on them. You know, our pens and our notebooks would have like the, the happy blue flame. When I was packing up some stuff recently, I came across uh, a copy of the calendar where my little drawing when I was in probably first or second grade was like the October drawing, but it was the consolidated natural gas calendar that was done through my school. You know, so we were really taught that's what we have the potential to do. That has really been insightful for me as an activist working with communities that have been taught to be dependent on the fossil fuel industry, where people have been raised to think this is all we have the potential to do, which is why any idea of a, a transition away from fossil fuels is so threatening to those folks. But it's also a lie. You know, once I then moved away from, from West Virginia, moved to Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh, there was a much more diverse workforce. While there was still fossil fuel development, the communities weren't entirely dependent on it. So then I knew adults that did all sorts of things and didn't work for the fossil fuel industry and saw that we all had the potential to do much more. The one thing that happened in school that I remember wasn't, you know, directly related to any environmental issues, but was related to uh, empowerment as individuals against institutions. When I was in fifth grade and my school was trying to get rid of all advanced placement classes, my mom, along with some other parents, started organizing against it. And they called a community meeting and wrote this letter inviting other parents to this community meeting about it. My mom sent me to school with all these letters for, to, to the parents of all the other kids in my class and said, you got to hand these out. And, and I was a really shy kid and didn't like to do that kind of thing. 
So she really emphasized like, you have to do this. It's really important. And so I, I did hand these out to all the kids in my class and the teacher saw what I was doing. And then the principal came in and collected the letters back from everybody. At the end of the day, then my mom came to pick me up from school and she had just been to the gym beforehand and she was really into weightlifting at the time. So she was like really fired up with lots of adrenaline. And she said, did you hand out those letters to everybody else? And I said, yes, I handed them out. But then the principal came and he collected them all back. And she said, what? (laughs) And she got all fired up and she stormed into the principal's office and the, the secretary there in the, in the outer area said, can I help you? And she said no, and just almost ripped the door off of the principal's uh, inner office and went in there and slammed the door. And I just sat out there with the secretary and we could both hear her screaming at the guy. And I kind of sat there with a little grin on my face. And then she came out with the stack of letters and handed them to me and said, tomorrow, you're handing these back out to everybody. (laughs) So that was the example that I grew up with, you know, that, yeah, institutions are going to do a lot to try to disempower us. And we've got to be tough and stand our ground. What continues to, I mean, these problems still go on, obviously, we're still fighting fossil fuels. And I know you are still actively doing that. What continues to motivate you or what gives you courage? A lot of my activist career, it was the anger that still fueled me and just the outrage of what was going on. Growing up in West Virginia, I think I had a really deep seated outrage at what the fossil fuel industry had done to my state and the place that I loved and and the communities there that fueled a lot of my fire for a long time. And that was effective. It was a good motivation for a while. But um, like everybody says, there's only so long you can run on the fuel of anger because it is exhausting and and draining. That kind of waned my fire a, a bit. And I kind of drifted away from a lot of the frontline work that I'd been doing previously and drifted back into one connecting more with the land just doing you know a lot of gardening and farming and also connecting more with with people and a few years ago I became a a massage therapist and that's given me a whole different way of of connecting with people you know I spent more than a decade really deeply embedded in activist culture and there's some great things about that a lot of toxic things about that in that culture it's really easy to be very judgmental about the rest of our society and and feel really disconnected and alienated from a lot of those people. Part of that waning of my motivation, I think it's hard to keep fighting for people and a society that you don't genuinely love and feel connected to and, and have strong compassion for when they just sort of seem like these distant others. And one of the things that I really love about doing massage work is that pretty much every single person that I work on, I really easily find deep, genuine compassion and affection for every one of them in this silent physical connection. And I know that most of them are probably people that, you know, if we were to sit down and have serious conversations, I might not have a lot in common with. I I might be really judgmental of them if our only interaction was having those kinds of serious conversations in sort of reconnecting with everyday people of our of of the world around me, of my community. It's broadened my sense of who my community is and rekindled that sense of universal compassion that I think is a more sustainable motivation. And that's what, what I'm finding now is that both reconnecting with the natural world that I love and reconnecting with the broader community of people that I love is is what motivates me to stay in that fight in whatever way that I can. And how does that play out in your activist work? It sounds like you've come to a place where you've kind of are trying to go back to a place of common humanity. And how does that affect what you do? For me at this point, I hope that there will be more integration at some point between things like my massage work and my activist work. At this point, there's, there's really not. That sense of connection and compassion that has been rekindled for me. I think that's really integrated with my my activist work and helps to keep me grounded and compassionate even in moments of conflict. You know, I've continued working on a campaign to shut down the last coal-fired power plant in New England, you know, which occasionally puts me in direct interaction with the folks that work in that power plant who feel very threatened by by the idea of shutting down this dirty old power plant that we all know kills people and transitioning to other forms of energy. Having a sense that the, that those folks are not just like some stupid distant others, but are people that I know if I was interacting with them, 
in a, in a different way, we would have a great connection. If any of those guys were on my massage table, I would give them a great massage and they would enjoy it. And, you know, and I would feel a deep sense of compassion for them. It helps to just keep that compassion flowing and people can sense that. We're always more effective when we can hold on to genuine compassion for any of the people that we're interacting with or engaging with, even in points of conflict, um, or perhaps especially in points of, of conflict. You know, I feel like that's something that's often hard to, to maintain in our world. You know, certainly with the trends of how we're engaging and communicating with each other, it's becoming more and more difficult. You know, I feel like it's almost impossible to have genuine compassion on social media. I think social media is a technology invented to destroy compassion and empathy and destroy any genuine sense of, of connection between people. The more that we can directly just like one human being to another connect, the more we have that potential to bring shared understanding and, and transformation and invite open-mindedness out of others. What advice do you have for youth activists now? I guess my big piece of advice would be to not be just an activist, to strongly resist the inertia that sucks people towards becoming a professional activist and sucks people deeper and deeper into the, the activist culture isolated from others, but maintain as much engagement and connection with the wider world that you can, including the non-human wild world that I think is critical to, to maintaining our, our sense of reality and getting past our, our sense of self-importance or, or that ego that can become so destructive to to social movements and also maintaining those connections to to people outside of activist culture i think is is so important for our own self-care and our own mental health um, you know i know so many activists that are really really struggling with mental health in part because the activist subculture can be so toxic and so keeping those outside connections and and an outside sense of purpose you know i think having a a non-activist job is really useful. <laughs> um, I found tremendous benefit in that. But keeping those broader connections, one, makes us healthier, and two, I think makes us more, much more effective and helps to push back against that tendency for social movements to just be this theater where we're all kind of performing for each other, pretending to to have an influence on things when we're really just talking to each other. The more we maintain a genuine connection outside of activist spaces, the more effective we're going to be at, at having influence outside of those activist spaces. You know, looking at the crises that we face today and the urgency of those crises, I know why people feel such pressure to just do the activist work and to dedicate every, every moment that they have to fighting these crises, to fighting for climate justice and social justice. But it, I think it's really critical that everybody live their life and, and continue to replenish yourself with loving the world that, that you need to keep fighting for. Do you have any advice for educators or, you know, how best to kind of instill that totality of approach to students that they work with, not just to be activists, but to really be part of humanity? The most important thing as for, for activists and for developing good activists is a sense of empowerment. That sense of empowerment doesn't have to come just from an activist campaign. Helping students and young people recognize their sense of power and agency in any area of their life is always going to make them a better activist. And so even if a student isn't passionate about a certain issue right now, encouraging that passion and a sense of agency in whatever it is that they're, that they're caring about, that they're passionate about right now, is always going to make them a uh, a better citizen and a better activist to remember that they have that power. Thank you so much, Tim. I really have enjoyed talking with you.